the time. On the dusty morning of July 30th, 1952, High Noon was released. Directed by Fred Zinnemann, this film is considered a Western classic for its depiction of integrity and morality, and for its allegorical message tying to the McCarthy blacklisting of its era. Howdy fellers, I'm John and I'll be taking you through the story and my analysis of the Western classic, High Noon. Set in an 1870 New Mexico Territory town, High Noon takes place during an era where the Wild West was feeling the encroachment of a newer industrial society. This is actually a small plot point later, but I'll get to that in a bit. The film centers around Will Kane, a recently married and supposed to be retiring sheriff, who seems to have had the whole town in his favor. The film contains lots of other important characters, like Quaker, pacifist, and wife to Will, Amy, Helen Ramirez, Will's old partner and current wife, to Harvey, Will's old deputy, and the man Will sent to prison, Frank Miller. And the film has a huge supporting cast. Uh, Mayor Jonas Henderson, Judge Percy Metric, the man who sentenced Miller, Herb Baker, this guy looks like Ian McKellen, Sam Fuller and his loving marriage. You want me to get killed? You want to be a widow? Is that what you want? No, Sam. No. Jimmy, this weird, rude, sassy guy that acts like he can't hear people from six feet away. May I wait here for the noon train? I said, may I wait in the lobby until noon? Sure, lady. The previous Marshal Martin Howe, Herb Baker again, Johnny, and a bunch of stubborn townspeople. But who really are these people, and what impact do they have on Will Kane? Well, let's find out, shall we? <laughs> Spoiler warning! Fake gun, fake gun, don't worry. It's a uh, fake gun, doesn't have, it's a pop gun, I think. Uh, it can't even shoot, it's like empty. Like, if you look down the barrel, it's like, uh, there's like a bar there, you can't... But yeah, spoilers. I know this movie only came out about... 70 going on 80 years ago now, but if you want to see High Noon and you don't want to be spoiled, then don't watch the whole video because I'm talking about High Noon in its entirety. Will and Amy Kane are sealing their marriage and Will's retirement from town sheriff when he gets a note from the train station. Apparently, Frank Miller, who was sent up north to prison by Will, was released and is on his way to town on the noon train. That's why it's called High Noon. And his gang is waiting for him at the station. The town won't have a new sheriff till the next day, and while Amy wants to leave and run as she is against murder, Will insists he must stay and finish off Frank. So, Amy decides to leave on that noon train when it arrives, with or without Will. Will then attempts to recruit some deputies to help him when the outlaws get to town, but slowly discovers he is alone in the battle. Judge Percy, the man who sentenced Miller, flees. Harvey Pell quits as Will won't put in word for him to become sheriff. Sam Fuller hides and has his wife send Will away. Martin says it's suicide. And Herb chickens out when no one else shows up. The only people that actually do want to help Will are too incapable and too young. Even at the bar, men are drinking with one of Frank Miller's gang members and betting on when Will will die, prompting such a well-deserved punch. At one point, Will attempts to recruit churchgoers. Though some of them defend the sheriff, you all ought to be ashamed of yourselves. I tell you, if we don't do what's right, we're going to have plenty more trouble. Don't you remember when a decent woman couldn't walk down the street in broad daylight? Don't you remember when this wasn't a fit place to bring up a child? Nobody ends up joining him. We've been paying good money right along for a marshal and deputies. Now the first time there's any trouble, we're supposed to take care of it ourselves. People up north are thinking about this town. Thinking mighty hard, thinking about sending money down here to put up stores and to build factories. But if they're going to read about shooting and killing in the streets, what are they going to think then? In one day, this town will be set back five years. He didn't have to come back here today. And for his sake and the sake of this town, I wish he hadn't. During Will's search, Amy has stayed adamant that she is leaving, even confronting Helen as she suspects that Will is only staying out of his love for Helen. Helen insists that they haven't been together for years, and as she is also Frank's past lover, she is also leaving town. Though Helen says she would take up arms with Will if she was with him, Amy reveals that she is a pacifist due to her brother and father dying at the hands of guns, and the two wait in each other's company for the train. In his office, alone, with no one at his side, Will pulls out a piece of paper and writes out his will. Until finally, High Noon arrives.
train arrives, and with it Frank Miller, thus the gang heads into town. Without his wife or any deputies at his side, Will goes to meet the gang. In the empty streets, Will manages to gun down two of Frank Miller's gang. Hearing the gunshots, Amy changes her mind and returns to town. Escaping a burning stable, Will sustains a wound and becomes cornered in a store. Amy finds Will under fire by Frank Miller and his last gang member, and Amy uses Harvey's hung up gun to shoot Miller's gang, breaking her religion. Frank holds Amy hostage, coercing Will out. But when Amy breaks free, Against everyone's judgment, Will defeated Frank Miller's gang with help from the last person anyone suspected. Will and Amy reunite, and the two leave town in a bittersweet ending. Talking about the mise en scene of High Noon, the looks of the setting and everyone just sells the whole western look perfectly. The town itself is actually great at moving the story forward, as we are given many scenes of Will walking between locations. A lot of the time he's alone, but with the background being in focus, it shows that while he may be in a populated town, no one else is near him physically and mentally. This shot here actually also exemplifies Will's loneliness, as the camera pushes out and we are shown this whole town but only one lonely person. Clocks are also a reoccurring image in the movie. They're in a lot of scenes backgrounds or just right in your face, which really sells the whole deadline that's fast approaching. Lighting is usually left to the natural sunlight, which improves the whole dusty western town vibe. And sometimes it does make for some harsh shadows. Fun fact, the smoke coming out of the top of the train actually meant that his brakes were failing, and though nobody knew that, and though the camera was smashed in a scramble to get off the tracks, the camera and the footage survived. And the people. I'm taking this hat off. I was going to do that at one point, I just forgot to. Hats off now. Moving to cinematography, there weren't too many shots that really stood out to me. Although the film did utilize a lot of moving camera shots to follow the characters, which was more interesting than using so many static over the shoulder shots. Personally, I'm wondering how they got such a clean shot of the carriage driving away, and the horses, and just like a shot of them sitting there and talking. I know it's not like caveman times when this was made, but like, it looks so smooth. And you're on like a dirt path. The camera work and sound too do stand out in a couple of sections, like this moment where Judge is talking to Will about Frank. I can't tell you what to do. Why must you be so stupid, Will? Have you forgotten what he is? Have you forgotten what he's done to people? Have you forgotten that he's crazy? Don't you remember when he sat in that chair and said, You'll never hang me, I'll come back. I'll kill you, Will Kane. I swear it, I'll kill you. And during the seconds before noon, the shots begin more wide with more characters, and then the camera moves in closer with more cramped framing to depict the stress and tension in the air. Then of course there's a release when noon strikes. Moving to acting, at first the acting of this movie... It, it didn't excite me. Some parts just kind of came across as people reading their lines to each other, and Gary Cooper also felt like a little bit too straight of an actor at some points. But after watching it a second time, and really paying attention to the characters, I've kind of come to like the serious and dramatic acting of the characters. Gary Cooper does great with the sort of subtleties of a man losing all hope, and I especially like Lloyd Bridges' Harvey, and how he portrays Harvey's sort of downfall. He's got great eyes and facial expressions. I actually left out a lot of horror story in the plot summary just for not overwhelmed with information, but he does have a really big place in the film. Basically, Harvey doesn't help Will as he wants Will to make him the next sheriff. He thinks Will doesn't like him because of Harv's relationship with Helen, but Will just doesn't think he'd be a good fit. Harv then backs out and he and Helen argue as Harv thinks that she's leaving to be with Kane. Helen eventually says Harvey is less of a man than Will, and the two break up. Harv goes out and drinks, and when he sees Will checking on some horses, he starts to fight as he tries to push Will out of town. But, Harv loses, 
And that's the last we see of him in the movie, as he's really lost his love and what seemed to be his best friend. I enjoyed Har's character. He was an interesting good guy who kind of fell off and became a small villain. I mean, apart from Frank Miller, he's actually the only one who fights with Will. Not to lump everyone else in the same kind of category, but everyone else kind of felt just so realistic and fleshed out. It actually made it kind of hard to follow for the first time, because it felt that everyone had a bigger stake in the plot than they really did. In particular, Katie Gerardo's Helen Ramirez felt really fleshed out, but even though she has all this plot with Amy and leaving town and Harvey, she didn't really affect Will's plot at all. There was this kind of pointless scene where she sells her store to a townsperson, which, although it kind of shows her relationship to the town, it doesn't really affect the plot at all. Even though she dated Will and Frank Miller and Harv and she has all the screen time, I feel like her character could be removed and nothing would really change. Like Amy, she obviously helps Will and Harv like roughs up Will a little bit, but Helen, she leaves. Helen was a great character, she was effective and I love her place in the film, but apart from really setting Harv off and helping Amy a little bit, I feel like she was underutilized. Okay, before I go on more of a tangent, Switching gears to editing. While the editing of this film is chronological, they do take multiple moments to peek at Miller's crew just waiting at the train. This doesn't draw away from the story, instead it helps the audience feel the dread that Will feels. Another interesting fact about this movie is that the film's runtime of 1 hour and 25 minutes is actually realistic to the movie itself. That means about every second in the movie is another second in real life. While it's not to a T, it is really interesting to see Will's story develop realistically. Speaking on sound, music and sounds build tension and mood in various scenes, such as the foreboding entry of the outlaws in town, the multiple chair shots, when Will enters a church, and especially the build up to noon. The film's opening song, The Ballad of High Noon, or Do Not Forsake Me, My Darling, or High Noon, is utilized many times in the film. It's the one currently playing right now, and it kind of acts as Will's theme as he walks between objectives. It's kind of unfitting sometimes because it's a little bit of a cheery song after some serious scenes, but as it was first used with the outlaws in the beginning, it kind of creates that sense that the outlaws are on Will's mind the whole time. Sung by Tex Ritter himself, the song actually went on to win the 1952 Academy Award for Best Original Song. Good job, Tex. Love that guy, I think. Oh, hold on. I'm getting a call. Hello? Oh, hey, how's it going? You want me to tell them that? Okay. Sorry, it's Twinkie. He just wanted to say... Give you odds. Kane's dead five minutes after Frank gets off the train. It's not much time. That's all Frank will need because I. You carry a badge and a gun, Marshal. You had no call to do that. You're right. When one of Frank Miller's gang leaves the bar, Will enters right after to hear the bartender and others betting on when Will will die. Will punches him, as he should, as everyone in the bar watches. I mean, the bartender's technically right, as Will did a bit of a power play here, punching the bartender, but that's the problem. Who wouldn't want to punch him after hearing that? Anyone else would have done the same, but Will can't, as he's a dignified sheriff. This instance shows how against Will parts of the town really is, and how awful this situation is. As though he's known these people for so long, he still has to act somewhat professional in his position. Will keeps his composure throughout this whole film, and even though no one steps up to help him, and many are even friends with the guys who want him dead, and a lot of people are being double-sided and rude and everything, this is the only moment Will lashes out on anyone. It really points out how he carries himself as a respectful town marshal. You want to know why I'm leaving? Then listen. Kane will be a dead man in half an hour, and nobody's going to do anything about it. And when he dies, this town dies too. I can feel it. I am all alone. After Harvey is kicked out by Helen the first time, he comes back later to find her packing. 
He insists she's leaving with Will, but she denies it and states that Will is more of a man than Harvey is. She realizes that the town doesn't care for Will, and if Will dies, then the town does too. Not only does this quote show Helen's understanding of the whole situation, but it also exemplifies the problem with the townspeople. Again, everyone praises Will and thanks him for his work, but when a time finally comes for everyone to show that admiration, nobody steps up. Everyone becomes a bystander, and if everyone goes against their praises and lets Will die, then the spirit of the town will die too. She also is great at making it clear to Harv that she's not acting like this because she loves Will more than him. Or does she? And she points out the whole problem with the town and everything. Basically, Helen, she tells Harv she's not cheating on him, she shows the whole problem with the town, and she slaps Harv, which was so well deserved. And that's really all I got for High Noon. I haven't seen that many westerns. Actually, I don't think I've seen any westerns. Let's recount Pate Wagon. Is that a 160s musical with Clint Eastwood? Yeah, he's got a good singing voice. I used to love that movie. Oh, that was a good movie. Excuse me, my favorite movie. Underrated movie. Go watch it. Maybe. I haven't seen it since ninth grade. Might have some bad stuff. Anyway, that being said, I like the movie. High Noon. Not Paint Your Wagon. I like Paint Your Wagon too, though. High Noon may not have had a lot of shootouts and action like other westerns, but that doesn't diminish its quality. It was a great film about integrity and being a lone man, and I love the world building of it. I know I said it so many times, but everyone felt so fleshed out. Justice for Helen, she should have had more impact. And it just seems like there's a whole town in this history that we can't see. It sells everything greatly. A little note here, I'd like the Chekhov gun we got going on. When Harvey Bannon's well in the beginning, he leaves his gun hanging up, and that's the same gun Amy uses to take down the gang member. I knew the gun was important! I know it's a sad moment because Amy just went against her whole religion and everything, but I was waiting for her to shoot that guy. I also feel like there could just be so much different analysis with this movie. Like looking into Helen's character, or a motif behind the deputies that left Will, or looking at Will's movement or something, or... Basically, there are so many things I could pick apart in this movie, but that would take too much time. And after all, we've only got until... conditioning again. It keeps on going on. <laughs> Gotta play it like a flute. <laughs> there you go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> this is actually the first time I think I'm doing that. That's so cool. I just never blew too much air. I just never blew enough air in. I was always doing it like... I gotta be like... That's how people do it. That's so cool.